You could take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 is where we will begin. I know I say this every time, but I love that song so much. Show us Christ. That is our aim. That's what we're here to do, because only Christ can satisfy. Only Christ can meet our deepest needs. And I want to say this to anybody who is visiting with us or has been visiting, and you're, you've continued to come back, and you're, you're curious. We are just a group of people who are united around our love for Jesus, because Jesus has saved us from our sin. We don't come here because we're perfect, and, and we certainly don't want to project that we think that, because we are all very messy people who struggle just like you do. The only difference is that we have recognized that our struggle is so deep that it brings us into God's wrath. It cannot be fixed by ourselves. We need Jesus. We need His death, His resurrection, and His endless life to save us from our sins. And now we are living by faith in Him, and that's what we're all about. And so keep coming if that's you. Keep learning. Keep asking questions. Keep finding people who, who in, in your estimation, te- seem to exude the joy that you so envy in your life and, and, and join us. And for the rest of us, let us be the kind of people that would attract hungry souls to Christ. That's who we want to be. That's the kind of church that we want to be. We're not a perfect church because we're not perfect people, but by God's grace, we exist to follow Jesus. That's what we're here to do. And during this worship service, we give particular attention to the Word of God because, as we believe, it is the preaching of God's Word that brings about change in our lives. This is, this is the whole idea behind the giving of this amount of t- uh, time in our worship service to explaining the meaning of Scripture. And as we understand Scripture, then we'll be able to understand more of Christ And as we understand more of Christ, then we will, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, be changed from the one, 2 Corinthians, from one degree of glory to the next, changed into the image of Christ. So that's why we're going to the book of Romans, because as we have been talking about for some time, uh, we are beginning a series focusing on Romans chapter 8. Perhaps you noticed the vertical banner right outside the auditorium as you came in this morning, and it gave the title of our series, which we're calling More Than Conquerors. And that title is taken from a phrase near the end of Romans 8 that we will be focusing on as we progress throughout the series. In this message, however, I want us to give an understanding of the flow of thought leading up to Romans 8 and an overview of the chapter so that we know where we're headed. I think this will help us as we get into this series. Let's have a word of prayer and ask God to open our minds and hearts so that we will understand and submit to what He has for us this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we're gathered here today stunned by Your grace, the kind of grace that takes miserable sinners like ourselves, raises us up and seats us to be with Christ, the kind of grace that takes people with addictions and bitterness wrapped in envy and all kinds of sins and frees us, that snaps the chains and that promises us eternal life. Or this is the grace that that saved us. This is that amazing grace that we want to celebrate now. But Father, we have still in our hearts regions that are yet unconquered by Your grace that we want to submit to You. So illumine our minds and our hearts to understand Your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we tend to feel small around enormous things. I've had the privilege of seeing the Half Dome in California and feeling small beside that massive piece of rock. I took a mission trip with some teens to Quebec, and on the way, we stopped by Niagara Falls. And I have been in a little boat at the base of that 
thundering cataract, uh, being sprayed by the mists and feeling very small at the immensity of Niagara Falls. I've had the privilege of seeing the Panama Canal, massive, massive piece of engineering, and feeling very small. And yet I have never felt smaller than I feel as when I approach the book of Romans. And because for nearly 2,000 years, students of this book have climbed into this letter and descended from its towering heights, feeling humbled and yet panting for another climb. And yet I have chosen to preach on one of the loftiest peaks in this book, and that is the chapter, chapter 8. And I think you deserve to know why, so I want to explain that to you. Several reasons, and they all spring from two main considerations. The subject matter of Romans, and then the manner in which I hope to preach it. First of all, the subject matter. Subject matter is glorious. Romans 8 stands as part of one of the most glorious epistles in the New Testament. One commentator writes that when anyone gains a knowledge of this epistle, he has an entrance open to him to all the most hidden treasures of Scripture. The great reformer Martin Luther declares about the book of Romans, this epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and is truly the purest gospel. It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of his soul. Now, Martin Luther knew what he was talking about because it was the message of this book of Romans that sparked in his heart a transformation that allowed him to see that salvation was not by works, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and allowed him to revolt against centuries of heresy and malpractice in the Roman Catholic Church and to return to a biblical understanding of salvation. From his study of the book of Romans, you may be familiar with the name John Wesley. He was the great 18th century revivalist. His brother, Charles, we sing many of his hymns. But John, was, John Wesley was so determined to live a devout Christian life, and yet so incapable of doing that. He, he was so determined that he went all the way from England to the American colonies to be a missionary in Georgia, to do something great for God. And he came back to England, feeling still empty and under the load of the guilt of his sin. It was a gospel that he did not yet understand. And back in England in May of 1738, Wesley recorded in his journal, listen to these words, quote, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle of the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing, get this, this is just a layperson reading Luther, the preface to Luther's commentary on Romans, but a quarter to nine when he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, Wesley writes, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and assurance was given me that He had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I could go on with testimonies of others whose lives have been radically transformed by the message of the book of Romans. But I think the point is abundantly clear. The subject matter of this book is glorious. But if Romans itself is glorious, then the eighth chapter 
stands as the Everest among Himalayas. Because consider, some have called it the inner sanctuary within the cathedral of the Christian faith the tree of life in the midst of the Garden of Eden. So what makes it so glorious? Just consider some of the themes in Romans 8. Freedom through Christ from the fatal havoc of sin and death. The voice of the Spirit telling us, you are a child of God. The sufferings of this present life being overwhelmed by the glory that is going to be revealed to us. The fact that we are connected to the love of God by a bond that cannot be separated, no, not through an eternity of eternities. Those are some glorious themes in Romans 8. Here in this chapter, we find medicine for illness that no doctor can treat. We find an embrace warmer and more comforting than the embrace any mother or father could give a child. We find truth so elevating, they continue to thrill us today. Yes, it is glorious, and there are, that's one reason why I want to preach from this chapter, but also reasons springing from the way in which I intend to preach it, and the way in which I hope that we will all study and learn it. And that is, I want to show you not just the force of Paul's argument, but also the path by which he arrives at that. And I think what what I mean by that is this. It's, It's helpful for us to not only know what is said and the conclusions that are made, but also how it is being said. It's kind of like the difference between someone telling you what a movie is all about and that can get really boring. Have you ever had someone describe to you what a movie is about, like just telling you about it? Like, no, it, it, the difference between someone telling you what a movie is about and actually experiencing the movie for yourself. That's what I hope I, we can do, is, is experience the flow of thought throughout Romans chapter 8 for ourselves. And, and my goal for that then is that the truths of this chapter w- would, would sprout roots right down into our hearts that would spring up fruit within our lives, that that we would immerse ourselves within the truths of this chapter so that it would change our lives. This is what we're going for. The Word of God brings about transformation. I think that this is what God will be pleased to do in our church, in our lives, as we respond to the truths of this chapter. Now, this will mean hard work for us. But this work will be rewarded by the benefits. And I think the benefits are that the Scripture will take a life of its own in our hearts. And so to begin, there are two things that I hope to accomplish. Oh, for three, actually, and here they are. First, I want to get a bird's-eye view of Romans 1 through 8, okay? A big-picture view of this first section of Romans high up in the air, and then we're going to zoom down a little bit more to get a bird's-eye view of Romans 8 itself, okay? So, first of all, bird's-eye view of Romans 1 through 8, and then a bird's-eye view of Romans 8, and then after that, I want to draw some application to our lives today. Those three things, bird's-eye view of Romans 1 through 8, focusing on Romans 8, and some application for us. So, first of all, what is Romans all about it is a letter. Here's some background so we must understand a little bit about who wrote it, when, to whom, and why. You could see you're turned in your Bible to Romans 1. You could see from the very first word that its author is Paul. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul is the one who is writing this. And the events that we have recorded in the book of Acts point to about the year 57 as the time when he wrote it. So around 57, and probably in the city of Corinth or nearby. Possibly some people think it might have been the city of Sancria, about six miles away from Corinth. Either way, 
right in that area, most likely Corinth. And as you could see, first of all, or, or further, he is writing this letter to certain people, and we find those people in verse 7. You're in Romans chapter 1. We looked at verses 1 through 2 to find who is writing. Now, verse 7, who he's writing to. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Now, the place that this letter would arrive would be that great city of Rome. They called it the eternal city, the capital of the world, the hub of the Roman Empire. All roads lead to, we know it, Rome. This was a central place. Now, it was a place that Paul had never visited as far as we know, but we reveal, we see a little bit about his heart. Look at verses 10 through 11. <clears throat> Paul is saying, I've never seen you, but I'm asking that somehow, verse 10, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. What did Paul want to do? He says in verse 11, for I long to see you. Apparently, he's never been there. He's never seen them as a church, although we understand that there are many individuals within the church that Paul has personal acquaintance with. Now, why did Paul want to see them? Why did he want to visit them? Look at verse 13. He reveals his purpose in wanting to visit them. You see it there in halfway through the verse? In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Now, we're asking the question, why is Paul writing? He's writing to these believers who are gathered in the city of Rome, and why, furthermore, did he want to visit them? Well, he tells us, I hope to reap some harvest among you. What did Paul mean by reaping a harvest among them and among the rest of the Gentiles? Well, he doesn't explain it here, but he actually picks up on that near the end of his letter. So go to Romans chapter 15, and we'll look at verse 24. We're trying to discover what was Paul hoping to accomplish by his intended visit to Rome. What was he trying to do? We'll pick up in verse 22, Romans chapter 15, verse 22. Paul writes, This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to where? Spain. Now, here's where it's helpful for us to understand a little bit about the geography here. We talked about the Roman Empire. Christ has given the Great Commission, beginning in Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria and where? To the uttermost parts of the earth the gospel was to be proclaimed. Paul was given a commission from the Lord Jesus Christ to bear witness to him to the uttermost parts of the earth, and now we catch a glimpse into the enterprising missionary mind of the great Apostle Paul, and that is he wanted to bring the gospel not just in the regions that have been already proclaimed with the gospel, he wanted to take the name of Christ even beyond. And if we were to see a map of the Roman Empire, we would see that the Roman Empire spread all the way from the Persian Gulf, from the Persian Gulf in the uh, what direction is that? The Persian Gulf in the east, all the way to, to, the, to Spain in the west. That is a, a vast span of territory. And Paul wanted to take the gospel to the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire. What was the furthest reach of the Roman Empire? It was Spain. You see what Paul is intending to do? He wants to take the gospel all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth to fulfill the Great Commission. But what will it require? What will be required for Paul to do that? He needs help. He needs a base of operation. You're in, chap you're in chapter 15. Look at verse 28. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. We're trying to figure out, why did Paul write this letter? What are the circumstances under which he wrote this letter? He was writing to a group of people that he hoped to be the base of operation from which he would be able to fulfill the Great Commission to the uttermost parts of the earth, the very fringes of the Roman Empire. And he needed the help of these Roman Christians 
the very hub of this great empire, the center of the world, the eternal city, Rome. But there was a problem. And this problem is at the heart of why Paul wrote this glorious letter. You see, when the church of Rome was founded, it was founded most likely by Jews, and then non-Jews, that is Gentiles, begin to trust in Jesus, and now you have a church composed of Jews and Gentiles. But at a certain point in the history of that church, the Roman emperor expelled all the Jews from Rome. You have to leave Rome now. So a bunch of Jews are leaving Rome and going to different places. In fact, that's why Paul, in Acts chapter 18, met Aquila and Priscilla, because they had been expelled from Rome, and Paul meets them, and that's how most likely Paul met a lot of the other Jews that he met and then addresses in Romans chapter 16. But here's what happened. Now, several years later, the Jews, having been scattered from Rome because of the expulsion by Emperor Claudius, are allowed to come back. Jews coming back then to a church that has been primarily Gentile. Now, what do you think happened after the Jews returned to this church? It was a mix of Jews and Gentiles. Now the Jews have been expelled. The Gentiles have been on their own for several years, and now the Jews come back. Return of the Jews stirred up questions that had been stewing beneath the surface, questions about the gospel, particularly what are the places of God's, what is the place of God's promise to the Jews? Which group, Jew or Gentile, enjoys special privileges in God's plan to save humans? What about all the Jewish laws? Must Gentile believers adopt those? If the Gentile believers have to adopt the laws, then what's the point of grace? Now, if they don't have to adopt the laws to the Jews, then what's the point of the law? Has God set aside His promises to His people? What is going on here? What is happening is that there is a rift that's threatening to split the believers in Rome a strategic platform for Paul's efforts to take the gospel to the regions beyond. And so, why Paul is writing this letter is to provide ex a further explanation of the gospel so that these people will understand the role of God's promises and the role of the people of Israel in the life of the church and in the truth of the gospel. And this is precisely why Paul why Paul prayed near the end of the epistle. If you're still in Romans chapter 15, I want you to glance back at verses 5 through 7. Remember I said that there was this rift that was threatening to tear apart the believers in Rome. Paul's hoping to use Rome as a platform for his furthering of the gospel to Spain, the very fringe of the Roman Empire. And he writes in verse 5 of Romans 15, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. There is a word, harmony. There needs to be harmony between the Jews and the non-Jews. In accord with Christ Jesus. Why? Why should there be harmony? That together you may with one voice do what? Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the whole point of Christian unity, not just so we can all get along, not just so we could have a club that doesn't have any conflicts or rifts. It's so that we can, with one voice and one mouth, glorify God. And ultimately, that was what was in danger because of the disunity in the Roman church. It was that God would not be glorified by competing factions within the church. And Paul is writing this letter so that they'll be unified around the truth of the gospel for the glory of God. Now, this brings us to the theme of Romans. Because the question of God's glory being at stake, the question of God's glory, will God be glorified? Will we be glorified even though there's these factions going on among the Jews and the Gentiles? Will we be glorified even though there's these questions about whether God has been faithful to His promises? This question of God's glory is like 
a jet engine propelling the energy of this letter from beginning to end. And, and this is why I believe, and I think that you'll see this too as you study the book of Romans, that the glory of God is very central to the theme of Romans. Because Paul is, is saying that, that the greatest problem facing humanity is that people fail to glorify God. We, we can see this near the very beginning. Go to back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. He's saying this, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The word that's translated honor there is the word glorified. They failed to glorify God. There is in the universe a vast vacuum of glory, and it has been created by the rebellious sin of humankind. The greatest problem that you and I face in this world today is that God is not being glorified, and that is the problem that Paul sought to address in this epistle. Where else do we see the glory of God in the book of Romans? We see it in chapter 3, verse 23. Look at this. Here is the problem with human beings. Here is the problem that we are faced with, for all have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. This is the problem, as Paul said earlier in verse 23 of chapter 1, that they have exchanged the glory of God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This is a glory that is so great that we can share with Him, as we'll discover in Romans chapter 8. It is a glory that, again, Paul mentions at the close of the first great section of this epistle, at the end of chapter 11. Please turn there. After plumbing the depths of the ways of God and defending the wisdom and justice of God against the question of rebellious and curious human beings. He proclaims in verse 33 of chapter 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that it might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. And if that were not enough proof that, the glo that glory is a central theme throughout the book of Romans, I would invite you to look at the final section in chapter 16 and verse 27. Paul ends with this doxology, To the only wise God, be glory forevermore. How will we get glory? It will be through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how that epistle closes. The glory of God. And yet the problem is that people aren't glorifying Him. The problem is that human beings, instead of glorifying God, have glorified themselves. Instead of honoring God as God, they have honored other things as God. Men and women, that is the problem that you and I face today. We glorify so many other things. We elevate so many other things in the place that only God deserves. And we exchange the glory of God for, for other things. We are idolaters, idol worshipers. And yet Paul proclaims the theme of Romans in verses 16 through 17 of chapter 1. I want you to turn there so you could look at it. With the backdrop of the yawning blackness of the absence of God's glory because of sinful human beings and the need for them to be righteous so that they can indeed glorify God as they should, Paul says this in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. How will God's glory be revealed? His glory will be revealed as God displays His righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is everything it takes to uphold the glory of God, which we have failed to do. 
And so here is, as concisely as I can, what Romans is all about. I try to put this as concisely and as accurately as I can. But I think it will help us to get this phrase in our minds. The gospel reveals God's righteousness in Christ for all who believe for His glory. I'll say that again. Here's the theme of Romans. The gospel reveals God's righteousness in Christ for all who believe for His glory. Let's take a flyby of these first few chapters to see how this develops. After a greeting and introduction in chapter 1, from verses 16 all the way to chapter 4, verse 25, Paul is explaining how God offers Christ's righteousness to everyone by faith. Now, I'm going to cover this material rather quickly, so fasten your seatbelts, and if you feel like you ever just cannot keep up, I have outlines printed in the lobby. They're sitting on the, the Welcome Center, if you want to grab that on your way out, okay? So, they're there for you. Don't feel like you have to write this all down. I just want you to feel the force of the argument leading up to chapter 8. That's what I'm doing. Paul is explaining how God offers Christ's righteousness to everyone by faith. And, and why do we need this? Look at verse 18. We need this because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Not only, we, we all need it, Jews and Gentiles alike. That's what Paul, the point Paul is making. The Gentiles need it because they are unrighteous. The Jews need it because they are unrighteous. Look at chapter 3 and verse 8. Uh, verse 9, rather. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Look at verse 20. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. What is Paul saying here? He's saying we all need the righteousness of God. We need a righteousness that's not our own, a righteousness to be received from God because we all are unrighteous. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God is righteous to demonstrate his wrath to human beings. In fact, God's righteousness is displayed in condemning sinners. And if that were the end of the story, that would leave us hopeless. God displays His righteousness by showing wrath to us. Is that the only way God displays His righteousness? Thankfully not. Because in chapter 3 and verse 21, we have this great word, but now. Oh, wait. We saw that the righteousness of God was revealed in showing wrath to sinners, but now we see that the righteousness of God is revealed in showing grace to sinners. God reveals His righteousness not only by showing wrath, but also by showing grace, by showing mercy. How can He do that? He can do that only because Jesus Christ died for our sins. This is the whole point of that great passage beginning in verse 21 and all the way down to verse 31. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Verse 26, this was to show His righteousness. His righteousness was shown in His wrath to condemn human beings, but also His righteousness is shown in showing grace to human beings so that He might be, the word here is righteous, so that God might be seen both to be righteous and the one who makes righteous people who are unrighteous. Isn't that the wisdom of God displayed? Isn't that absolutely marvelous and astonishing that God can stand righteous and yet making unrighteous people righteous? That is the heart of the gospel. That we can have a righteousness not our own because there is nothing that we can do to merit God's grace. Paul gives an example of this in chapter 4. Is this the way God has always worked? Or was it at some point in history 
when actually people earn salvation by works and not by grace. Paul says, no, no, not the case at all. This was, this was so with Abraham. That's what he's doing in chapter 4. He's saying this is the way God has always worked in the past, by grace and not by works. And now in beginning in verse 5, you have a new section in Romans. So in, in, from the beginning to chapter, the end of chapter 4, what Paul is doing is saying how, he, how God offers righteousness to people through Jesus Christ. Now in, verse, in chapters 5 through 8, Paul is giving assurance to those who have Christ's righteousness. How God gives assurance to believers who have Christ's righteousness. We have assurance because Christ is reconciled to us to God, because Christ frees us from the tyranny of Adam's sin. We have assurance because Christ frees us from the tyranny, chapter 6, of our own sin. We have assurance, chapter 7, because Christ frees us from the effects of the law. And now the question arises, how can the power of sin be broken in our lives? I mean, how can we be sure that we're going to be free from condemnation? And how can we be sure in the midst of life's trials that this doesn't mean that God has stopped loving us? Because even though we've been justified by faith, even though we stand righteous in God's sight, still we experience the same sort of effects that all people experience. And that's where Paul begins the great chapter 8. Therefore, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For we did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. We have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children than heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. And we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself 
intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that, my friends, is why I long to preach to you on the book of Romans chapter 8, the 8th chapter of Romans. Because here is a chapter that will offer us such assurance in the Spirit. And here is what chapter 8 is all about. We have assurance because of the Spirit within us. Verses 1 through 13, He is the Spirit of life. He is the Spirit of life that frees us from sin. And He is the Spirit of life that frees us from death. He, furthermore, is a Spirit of adoption. We see this in verses 14 through 17. And He is the Spirit of glory and hope. We see that in verses 18 through 30. And then finally, in verses 31 through 39, we have a celebration of this assurance. Now briefly, we've seen an overview of Romans 1 through 8 and a brief overview of Romans 8. Some questions consider. First of all, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe the gospel? If you're here this morning, you are on one of two paths. Either you are trying to establish your own righteousness, or you have submitted to the righteousness of God offered to you through Jesus Christ. If you are trying to establish your own righteousness, the end is eternal destruction. But if you Submit yourself to the righteousness of God, which is offered you to you because of the sacrificial atoning death of Jesus Christ. God proclaims that you are righteous in His sight. Is that you this morning trying to establish your own righteousness? 
It's not you insisting on your own way. Have you gotten this idea that, that becoming a Christian is adding one new layer of rules and regulations on your already complicated life? I, if, if that's the case, I'm very sorry that you've learned that, and I want to immediately disabuse you of that error because the gospel does not burden you with a new layer of rules. It frees you from condemnation, and it frees you to love and obey God in a way the law could not accomplish in your life. It's what Paul described in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when he said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All old things have passed away. All things have become new. Do you believe the gospel? You can. You must. Second, if you believe the gospel, do you live in light of the gospel? Or do you lapse back in trying to establish your own righteousness? Do you rejoice in the fact that Christ has freed you from condemnation? Do you rejoice in the fact that nothing can separate you from the love of God? Or do you live in constant fear and timidity? Do you live in the light of the gospel? And finally, are you motivated by the glory of God? Are you motivated by the glory of God? Just as the glory of God was that propelling impulse that, that provides the energy from beginning to end of this book of Romans. It, does the glory of God move you? Are you inspired by the glory of God, or, or do you find yourself infatuated with so many other little things? Here is the problem that we have, even as Christians. We get so obsessed with our little games we get curled into a little position in which all these little things are so important to us and God wants to raise our, our eyes to behold His glory and let that be what motivates us. The glory of God is on display when His Son, Jesus, allowed His hands and feet to be pierced and His head to be lacerated by a crown of thorns standing in the place of sinners. The glory of God is on display when God transforms sinners to be like His Son, Jesus Christ. When He allows Christians to be freed from the bondage to their little idols and, and to live for the glory of God. There's nothing there's no vacation home. There's no time with grandchildren. There is no career. There is no school you could get into that, that even compares with the glory of God. We can find a thousand things to excite us, but nothing can compare with God's glory. I find that it is so true what C.S. Lewis wrote in that sermon, Weight of Glory. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Let us be motivated by the glory of God. That's what the gospel is for. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our Father, I pray that you would help us now as we observe your supper. I pray that our hearts and minds would be ready to remember what you've done for us and what that means for what we should do for you, to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.